Hello, I'm Chris Athanas. I'm a KMP developer. Tech Sports coming out Tuesday. They said, they said this time they're going to close it. So I'm reacting to uh, continuous delivery. Uh, he's got a really great channel. He's a bit more enterprise level stuff. I'm talking about like more startup kind of like get, get it off the ground, see where you can go with it. Uh, sometimes this can happen inside of organizations, but it's usually part of the culture already. Uh, for something like that to already to take off, it's really difficult to get someone who is a um, who is in the middle here as a pre preserver type who's who's they've already seen they already they already found their little tunnel right they only already found their um, silver hoard or lead mine or dungeon grind and you're brought on just to just to kind of fix some bugs or you know just to just to get this get this project out the door right you're not you're not in there to change or do anything or add your add your two cents so. Um, so let's, let's, let's hear what he has to say about the five things that waste time and money on a software project. Software development is a commercially important activity. Most modern businesses are, to a large extent, software driven, even if we don't always think of them in that way. So wasting time and money on it is a really bad idea. And yet many, maybe most organizations, do things that end up doing both of these. So here are five extremely common ways in which organizations waste time, money and effort in software development. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content like, the Explorers, subscribe. the planners believe that the secret to success Wait, is to oh, put groups it, in software development. The planners and the explorers. The planners believe that the secret to success is to plan in enough detail and with enough accuracy to know what to do and when to do it. Right. This is almost every project I've been on since I came back to software development in 2012 and started learning all about this agile scrum business because I sold my company. I was doing adventure driven before that. I was I had no plan. I was doing this exploration thing, trying to get to the next thing, get to the next thing, get to the next thing and still have my insights and doing my things my way without having to go work for somebody else which wants to have it all planned out because this is the industrial process, right? It does make sense in an industrial context. If we were making, if we already had the product and we want to get it shipping through our shipping system, like all that stuff, Yes, these guys are crucial. But the, to get to the thing that actually becomes the saleable thing that people actually want to buy, that these people then have to get involved in helping out with, yeah, it's this stuff. This is the adventure-driven stuff. The explorers, and I'm firmly in that camp, believe that software development is a lot more complicated than that. And so instead, it depends on a process of continual exploration, learning, and discovery. Right. And so the secret to successful software development is to optimize to be really good at that process of learning and discovery. And be okay with... It ain't gonna, they're gonna fail. And most people are just totally not familiar with this whole concept. And I'm just why I get a lot of static in the comment section. People are like, this is not possible. I'm gonna do a review of some of the comments I've gotten over here. Like, this is not a thing. You can't, right, have you thought about this? Have you thought about, oh, yeah, I've, I've been in all of this crap. And then we have to go back to something stripped down for people like me that are, that people like me and uh, probably you, because you're probably listening this far, unacceptable, outstanding, the stuff that we, we wanna just create means we also want to destroy, right? And that's just, the preserver goes, what are you doing? We're trying to make money here. I'm trying to send my kid to college. I'm sending, I need to get braces and a new SUV this year. I don't go on three, three vacations, you know? Like, let's just not try and rock the boat, guys. And that's, you know, that's us. That's, we, we get frustrated. We come in there, hey, if we just destroyed this process, we could create this and the preserver's like, there's no guarantee you're right. Well, no, no, no. That's not what the, that's not what the agile coach told us. That's how the agile certified trademarked scrum master said we should not be doing that. We should be following this plan. Do the do the Jira burn down. You know, we should keep going through the uh, and, uh, dead ahead. Move it forward ahead. Don't don't. We only don't want. We don't try anything that hasn't been tried before. Oh God, no. I think that this big difference in perspective underpins the waste that is so often common in software development. Pick the wrong viewpoints and you end up doing the wrong things. In this episode, I'll yeah, I mean that's a big part of the process of exploration. You're, you're probably going to go down a wrong path or two or six or twelve. I want to talk about five problems that will lead you to spend more time, money, and effort than you need to when building even very complex software systems. The first of my five is not building what users want. Right. Spending time and effort building stuff that no one wants is clearly a waste. But in practice, it isn't at all easy to know what the right things to build are. Yeah. Microsoft did a study of their own product decision making. They came to the conclusion that two thirds of their ideas made zero or negative contribution to Microsoft's aims. <laughs> Whoops. That is, two thirds of their ideas were bad ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the thing too. A lot of people have lots and lots of different ideas, but which ones are going to work? Well, 
you're going to have to spend some time down here in this crap. In some business, some other business, some other somebody else's process, they, they invented a long time ago that the, that the preservers are all documented very well. And all they do is need to refine this. We need to get a few more horses on the team as opposed to get a whole another technology like a tractor or, 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 or something else, some hyperdrive thing. We're going to get some more horses to, to, to tug this thing along. They're really great at that. And who isn't? It's super easy. It's not like that hard of a math. It's like, okay, we did 10 units today. Can we do 11 units tomorrow? Is that possible? Right? They're not talking about like what the unit should be because they're not taught any of that stuff. We are trained from the industrial revolution style that we have to, that, that management, their job is to, to cut costs and make things more efficient, but they don't know how to make something new. That's a whole, that's a whole other thing that we don't even, they don't even talk about in college. It's like kind of implied. It's like, mm-hmm, uh-huh. you're right. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's not, it's not like right in front. It's like, oh yeah, it's a creative process and there's an end to it. And you, you have to, you have to give it. The ideas that the customer that a customer will pay for, two thirds of their ideas arrive at it because they didn't go through this filter of having to like get customers to actually go to a sales call and say, "Hey, this is going to improve your thing more," and convince these guys, usually these preservers who have some system that's going that they know isn't going well, right? And then you're coming in like, "We'll destroy that system and create a new one." Like, how they how do you know it's better? A lot of times they don't. And a lot of this stuff that they don't find out till later, but there's ways to find out earlier. But it's a lot of ego it has to be dissolved in that process. That's why people like talk about Steve Jobs and all these other people being very uh, hard to work with and stuff is because of this challenge that they get. It's like most of the preserve, most people that go into programming are these preserver types. They just want a job. They want to have a nice thing. Can we just do make it five percent easier, right? And and it's like Jobs are coming from this other thing. He's like, no, I want to make this. All this stuff is bad. Like all the, every how we think about these things is all bad. Coming from the from the from the engineer point of view, it's it's terrible. It doesn't work. It's super complicated, and uh, eight two thirds of our ideas are bad. Like and they're all implemented because it's feature feature factory time. These were bad ideas. Other research says it is actually quite a lot worse than that. At two thirds of the ideas at Microsoft being bad, they're actually doing rather well and a lot better than most organizations. This research says that for most software projects, eighty percent of features are rarely or never used at all. Right. And so it's really, really difficult to get engineers that have been through this, been through the school process. It was all this preserving stuff. And oh, it's like, here's the language. You learn it this way. And this is what this class and object structure means. They have no idea how this applied, but the syntax, you will know all the syntax and all the curious ways that people have, have, have arranged code to do curious things. Right. It's like, okay, but how does this apply to someone's actual problem? Well, that's your, that's your problem, dude. That's where you got to figure out. That's where you come in. An entrepreneur can find these things like jobs. And he's got, if he has a technical engineer, he's like, is this possible? Is this possible? And have somebody to rapidly bounce those ideas off who isn't being a total ass, is like playing along and doesn't just want to have their ideas. It meant it's like this other, the visionary thing that's happening that it's very difficult to know if they're even sane, right? That's a lot of that. A lot of that stuff. A lot of the stuff's happened though. So I worked in tech support. I was down here in these pits and these mines and these, some of these companies. Right. So when I first went was at a games company that had just converted over to a production, doing production software, uh, productivity software. So it was doing games. So it had the whole game vibe, which is all this adventure driven stuff. You've got to be kind of crazy back in the days when you were doing that to do soft, a games company. What? But it made a bunch of money and they took that money and they blew and they bootstrapped it into this productivity software because they saw they could do the same amount of work, take about the same amount of people, the same vibe put it in this production software and totally dominate. Well, they did. They did super, super well. They, they, took, the, they took those ideas. So I worked in tech support. And <clears throat> so I had to deal with people's customers. And what did I hear most of the time? 80% of the problems are always the same problem. And they're only using this tiny piece of the software and basically using the presets and basically the stuff that's already built into it because they have this other thing they're working on. They just want to get it done. And for some reason, your software is not working and now they're calling, right? So what I realized from that point on is that you really have to focus in on the 20% that they actually are using and forget about the 80%. Just focus in on the 20% and let that other, if somebody else, let some other company handle that 80%. Focus in on that 20%. And if you get that stuff right, people love you. Oh my God. They say, how did you find, how did you figure it out? It's like, we just listened to what you had to say. We cut a lot of stuff out. We said no to a lot of the features. 
instead of having everybody super be busy in the pipeline, always making something new, it's like, hey, can we sit back and like think and talk and maybe call some of the customers up, have the developer talk to them on the phone or talk to them in a meeting somehow? It's like, hey, we'll give you you know a preview of the next thing because we uh, we we see that you're using our product and we would like to just see how what you have to say, what do you have to do? Like, and you get a bunch of those, you talk to them, not take their don't implement what they say. You just talk to them and listen. And like eventually, and if you're in the mind, right mind space, you'll come up with something that's even better than they could even think of. It's not adding six horses. It's the thing It's making a hyperdrive, right? It's like you're, you're, you're trying to, they, they don't know what's possible. They have only seen what they've seen, right? You know what's possible. You know what's kind of what could be contained. If you can concentrate on that little 20, a whole new thing, a whole new thing, a whole new thing. It's like, no, refine the thing that that's the main, the main issue that came to you for. So if it really is as bad as this, then we're all in danger of wasting huge amounts of time on building features that no one cares about. And this is the new, this is the next revolution, right? That's happening is these big corporations, they are stuck in this mindset. So they have to do the, fe they have to do the feature factory because they don't know what else to do. They don't know what else to do. They, they aren't thinking about the long, well, not most of them, most of them are not thinking along these lines of like, what can I do to basically make it simpler for the customer, easier to be more, more fun, more joyous, less of a pain in the dick. Like, you know, not, not add more features. Like the Jira, the Jira, all those buttons and switches and stuff. Like, like, can we turn some of that stuff up? Nope, nope. It has to be all in your face all the same time. Like, look at all these features that I, I built that button right there. And so some of the, some engineers are like, look, you can't turn it off because I built that button. And it's super important that I keep my job and maintain that button. However sure we are that we have a killer idea and that we really do understand our customers and users and so know how to make them happy, however much effort we spend on market research and talking to customers, the data says that even when we ask them to tell us what they want, they don't really know the answer to that question right. either. This is right. doubly true. But they will tell you what they don't like. And there's some hints in there. And these, and, and if you're having this done by a committee, by remote control, by, by market, market research questionnaires, you're missing a big chunk of it. Like just talking to the people on the phone, you can hear in their voice whether what kind of what kind of user they are. First of all, what level of user they are, right? And and is it going to be your is your is it going to be your power users who are going to demand all kinds of crazy shit for their particular use case, right? Because they just want to save money themselves, right? Save money and time. And if they got a developer on the phone, oh, I can influence this guy. It's like no, that's not what we're listening for. We're not listening for feature requests. We're listening to what what are you dicking with that's just like really hate, just really hate. Really hate, but you hate, you're just like, what are you just really, that's the stuff you're listening for. Like, not necessarily there are solutions either. Their solutions are often to add another horse. And that's not it. True, if we're doing anything at all innovative. As Steve Jobs famously said, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. Yeah, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. Exactly. Now, what's scary about this is you have to actually show them stuff, right? You actually have to show them the thing. You actually might have to build some things. <gasps> and you might, it probably might not, might not work. And that takes a lot of time. Ooh, it takes a lot of time. But there's just no, there's very few people who are trying to do this. They're in a feature factory, burn down chart, Jira, burn down dungeon grind. They think that adding new features is the way to go. It's like, no, no. The data says that we're fooling ourselves. We don't really know if our customers like our ideas until we try them out and they get to see them. Yeah. This is just as true of any product. There are always more failures than there are successes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have to really acknowledge this. If you're going to be going into the software development, this kind of work, now you can do a copycat for a little while, do the lowest price leader, and go to the lava lakes and direct competition. People will survive for a little while. People, VCs will throw money at it thinking that they're going to be the, the guy in the lead. And like, oh, this is... That's the kind of thing that has to happen. It can be it can get really expensive, or you can get very focused in on what your actual niche down customer and like really nailing it for that particular person. And it may not be the billion dollar market. It may be the million dollar market. It may be the thousand dollar market. But once you kind of in that vibe, there's all this other stuff that that appears when you're in that mindset that would not be appearing when someone sends out a questionnaire. Would you please fill this out for us? And let us know what you like and don't like in our software product. Like, no, you have to talk to people. You have to talk, you have to, talk to people who are already engaged in doing your product, not just a random person off the street. It's like someone who's already kind of like in your, in your realm of what you want to do, right? The difference in software is that we should have an advantage because software is a lot easier to change. Uh, you, it, it depends on how you write it. It depends on what level you're writing it. I'm going to get into that a little bit more later in this in this. In this uh, in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the easy to change part. <coughs> sometimes, <coughs> sometimes you might want to break, make something that's not easy to change. Maybe you're making something that gets to be thrown away. 
So don't try to make it easy to change. Make it just to see if there's anything here. That's called an MVP, right? Is there anything anything around here? Anything? Is this everything in the ballpark? Is this useful at all? And then, after you've kind of verified, then you put all this other junk in there, the monitoring, the testing, you make it easy to change, all, all that other stuff too. That's, that adds the extra steps before you, so you're building stuff that you don't need yet. That's the other thing. It's like, d d don't build something until you need it. You need to build it. Try and do it a different way. That's a big secret. And people are like, no, it's a software solution. You gotta write software. It's like, no, you don't. Maybe you just write a website. Maybe you just have a phone number than physical things. At least it should be, as long as we build it in ways that keep it easy to change. Let me pause there and thank our sponsors. Okay, I'm lucky. That we discuss company in the world. Do you want to go um, help engineering companies offer products in continuous delivery. Our ideas are bad ideas. Okay. Click on the links in the description below and do check them out. Yeah, his so okay. if so many of our ideas are bad ideas, then we need to optimize our development process to allow us to have lots of ideas and identify the bad ones as early as possible. Right. So how do you do that? Have you been in an organization that's even done that? Or they know, no, they have a solution. They already have a solution. They already know what they want to do. And they, now we just need you to come in here and uh, do the JR, JR tickets, burn down. And okay, you, you, it's really good to go into those environments and go do maybe one or two of those projects just to see like, okay, there's just a lot of inefficiency here. These are people that are they're trying to reduce the risk of being blamed for something. These are people that are super risk averse. Right here it is. Here, where is it right here? Risk. This is the dragons. That, these are the things. That, this is the dragon's journey on the epic quest. Is risk, and you're gonna go. Out, you're, are you gonna do a direct attack? It's all like this competition. You're gonna go attack somebody else's walls that these that these uh, preservers have built up. Are you gonna go? Is that what you're gonna do? Oh, okay, so that's pretty risky. You do know that when you're going direct. When you're tr when you're copying someone else's feature set, which had gone through these things, lots of ideas that identified and discarded all kinds of bad ones, and then identified and amplified the good ones. How that happened, well, it's really a matter of taste, <laughs> focus, uh, ethics, morality, um, perspective. Uh, 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 why are you doing this? Who are you doing this for? What are they like? What are they about? Who are all that stuff in there is part of this whole process, which is for most engineers and most MBA type business people, super uncomfortable. Whoa, 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 feelings? Ooh, I don't know about that. You're getting a little too, a little too spicy there when you talk about feelings and emotions. What? Ooh, we're not wanting to type, typey typey. So that we can discard them and stop wasting our time on them. We need fast feedback. And ideally, we need to get our ideas into the hands of real users as early in the life of the idea as we can to see if it's bad or good. Right. And, and this should be happening way before with way less tech involved, way, way before we even do it. Start to even talk about architecture, software design, UI, way, 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 way before that. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, first you have to have an organization, which usually means you're going to be starting small and have someone with this attitude already, whether they have it already or they saw this video. It's like, oh, there's an attitude. There's a, there's a vein in here that will get me to the thing that... Is, is producing all the stuff that I'm seeing, all the features I see are these big, big companies, things, and all these successful software things. I'm like, where did that stuff come from? Right? And why aren't they adding every other feature on it? Why does Facebook add this feature or this thing over here? It's like, there's a reason. There's a reason. People may don't like that stuff, man. They don't use it. They don't want it. They're, ugh, ugh. They have thousands of people working on that app, and it's still the front of the thing hasn't, hasn't changed since 2012. It's like, why? Why is that? Why? Because that's what they want. That's what their customers want. They just want to see the posts and laugh and react. Ha ha ha. And not have 500 reacts, just three or five. That's human. That's human. That's 80% of humanity right there. That's, that's most of people here, right? Is this, is this people here? Is like a different little slice from, from right here, less. <laughs> like everybody's like, oh, I'm so cool with it. It's only the people at the end and the edge. Like the tech people's like, I can make this better. And then I was like, well, you're not understanding what it's for, right? You're, you're thinking that by adding tech, you're gonna make it better. Now, sometimes that's true, but most of the time it's not. And then learn how we might improve on the good ones and try something different for, to the bad ones. If you'd like to learn more about how to get that better feedback and to learn faster, do check out our free tutorial on continuous delivery. All There's right. a link in the description. I, I mean, that's, that's technology solution. I think there's other, there's other thing I'm talking about is more like perspective and insight and like seeing a bunch of crap and 
living through people talking like, oh, this is the best thing ever. And then living through their what they recommend. It's like not the best. It's actually the opposite of the best thing ever. It's like the worst thing ever. Description below. The next big waste of time and money is big teams. It's been known yeah. since at least the early 1970s sure. that big teams don't work for software development. As Fred Brooks famously said, nine women can't make a baby in a month. Right, right, right. You tell, so, so you can't tell this these industrial people, right? They have been told you can make nine women, you can take nine women and make a baby in a month. And in a production industrial process, that's true, right? You can split each task up and make a bunch of machines or different manufacturers, make sure they're all the tolerances are all correct. You tell them what the tolerances are. So they go through and they'll throw out the ones that don't work, right? Is that so you're doing a bunch of waste, right? So a bunch of bunch of bad things that don't so it's all this production mindset that was that the how would the managers supposed to know? They never encountered this software development thing before. When it takes perspective and insight and morals and ethics and psychology and feelings. <laughs> oh no, what do you mean? What do you mean feelings? Ugh. Ugh. Software development is a complex, creative process, yet we still see usually big organizations falling into this trap of throwing right. armies of people at a problem. So I don't know why he doesn't mention like, hey, yes, because that's how they're trained. They are trained in how to make big corporations go zoom and work at a big efficiency scale. So this is just the process to them. Well, no wonder they're not going to get. So this is it's for people that are listening still, like looking at this stuff. This is such a massive uh, advantage that you have for the small team that's able to like see this stuff and slice off a customer base from this group of people who, who are never going to change until they see. And they saw Apple. They're like, why don't they, they look at it? Like, oh, it's corporate, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, he's a fucking gangster punk. He's a gangster punk. Like Jobs is a gangster punk. And corporations are like, no, it can't be. It's like, yes. That can be, and that is this is the this is where all that stuff that we love comes from. Is those types of people, not the guys that are trying to slice off six seconds off the production line. Arr, you said three points, now it's seven. You are you're gonna get on a pit pit program. <laughs> I love this internal memo from Thomas J. Watson, once CEO of IBM, complaining and asking about how the comparatively tiny Cray Computers team could have beaten the mighty IBM with their vast resources to producing the world's best supercomputer. Oh. Seymour Cray's observation on seeing a copy of this memo, it was that I think Mr. Watson has answered his own question. Right. Small oh, he's being coy there, but it's like, dude, it's because your teams are so big, too big. The number of networks, the number of people that have to agree and all have conflicting opinions is too, it's too big. It's too big. It's sorry. It's too big. It doesn't work. I know and it sucks because all these industrial people really want to make, if you've got a PhD in computer science, you're just going to be a cog in the machine, just be popped in and popped out. No, that's not how it works. Tacit knowledge in software development is huge. And there would, I can see a day in the far in the future when they go, oh yeah, tacit knowledge, super important on software. You can't just get rid of people and replace them into a cog. And they're worth way more on your, to your company by staying than by shipping them off because they asked for a $5,000 raise. <laughs> Small teams simply work better than big teams, dramatically better. The Team Topologies book advocates for teams sizes of eight people or fewer. <laughs> yeah, Most I say seven. I say an adventure driven. I have not seen it go past seven in any, in any, it go well. It's always going to be less than seven. When it stays at seven, when you keep in there in round seven, they're all involved. They're all moving. They're all, everyone has to, has a hand in the pie. They're not just tick box ticking. Like there's no manager. There's like a UI guy and a tech guy. And a couple, a couple like software guys, and maybe a business guy in there somewhere. Yeah, it's not, it's not. Hey, can we get sixteen juniors in here to do the UI mockups? Uh, no, no. One of those guys is sometimes a manager. Hey, managers can be learned to do UX and UI. They can be. Like that is a job role that they can be rolled out to for some of them. For some of them, some of them are like I hate doing this manager thing. I want to do this creation destruction. Deal. I want to take so I'm so sick of like working at these companies where everything's so inefficient. I'd like to try my hand at it. It's like, well, you gotta you gotta push, man. You can't just you can't just be a boxer going around and checking people's schedules. No, it's it's not gonna be that's not gonna cut it. Favorite research on this topic is a metadata analysis of over four thousand software projects. They divided them up into two groups: those with a team size of twenty or more, and those with five or fewer. Then they measured how long it took each team to reach 100,000 lines of code. Ah, oh, that's the this, this, this study. I get it. I know where he's going with this. He's saying, look, 
if you have 20 people or if you have like five people, or is it five people or 20, 20 more, it doesn't matter. You're, you're going to, you're just, everybody's going to be just stepping on their toes. And it's just going to take about the same amount of time to get to the result of the, to the program that's functional, right? It's just going to be stepping on each other. So some people are going to get there faster and they're going to make it more robust by adding testing, blah, 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 blah. Or some people are just going to kind of grind it out and figure it out along the way. <laughs> and that, this has been the norm for every project I've been on as well. Counting lines of code is a terrible metric for productivity, yeah, but it is yeah. easy data to collect, and it certainly says something about the rate of development. Uh, On average, over all of the teams, it took nine months to produce 100,000 lines of code. It's really surprising that they haven't done more studies like I, I'm talking about, like with this, this, this personality trait that I'm talking about and this, this, uh, the, the, the attitude behind it, which is so obvious to me, like looking at the back and just watch, like watching these old videos, listening to these guys talk, it's like, yeah, that's what they're, they're talking about. This adventure-driven stuff. They're talking about that there, this thing going past the silver horde stuff, which is just the same tech project over and over and over again, different flavors. Yes, it pays super well. You you can eat well with the silver spoon, and you can get the four hundred one k program going. Yes, no problem. When you start to go up to this this thing, you start to get the happiness, right? That and so ah, oh, it's not. I hate my job. Every day is the same as the other day. It's like yeah, because you, you the only way you get to the happiness if you're going to be a creative person, it is to go up is to go up into this and, and start dealing, you know, de dealing with this dragon, looking for a cave opening, deal with the dragon. So I bet there's a way to, to structure it, but I have also have a feeling that this is trade secret. This approach to software development, even though they all say it, they all tell it, they are not going to give you the step-by-step -step program because maybe they don't know how to do it. Like, like a pickup artist guy is like someone who's like a natural pickup guys who can't really train someone who's like just off the street you know r regular person oh here is how you pick up girls like no the pickup artist has got all this stuff that he's not able to verbalize that will never he can't can't, can't transfer it so it might be that kind of thing or it might be just thing we're just not comfortable with that the people who do the studies and do these do these things that work at the institutions they're just not comfortable with Looking at that or being in the presence of the destroyer and the creator, even though they're right in the middle and they they love the things the creator brings on, but they really hate the thing the destroyer gets rid of, even though that's the same thing. It all loops around. Of code. Teams of 20 people or more, on average, got to 100,000 lines faster than the smaller teams, as you might expect. But they only beat those smaller teams by less than a week over that nine-month period. So person for person, a team of five people is nearly four times more productive than a team of 20. And when you look at the quality of the work they produce, the 20 person teams created five times as many defects as the smaller teams. So you can be pretty certain that the next 100,000 lines of code would have taken them a lot longer. Yeah. Because now, as well as writing all that new code, they'd also have to spend time fixing all of the bugs. Right, because the communication and the, and the level of uh, ability and the synchronization can be a lot tighter with the small number of teams. So that's, that's just that that is a competitive advantage for for, for people like you and me that want to do some adventure driven stuff like there's really not a lot of pushback happening when you clear the path so they introduced in the first pool code it's the it's the mistake of like trying to go in it's like oh i'm just a regular programmer i can anybody can do this stuff it's like no 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 adventure driven stuff is for an elite crew <laughs> because it's so tempting just to go do a just to do a silver horde, a bug hunt and a silver horde for somebody else. Just to go do somebody else's dream. Just go implement their software. It's so much easier, right? Because the risk is way less. So it's understandable, right? It's understandable. If you'd like to learn how to better organize things with small teams, I recommend that you read the Team Topologies book. There's lots of valuable content there. Here, I'll give you the hint. Keep it less than seven and you'll be fine. Just go over seven, you're, gonna, you're just going to have problems, man. It's just, it's just the nature of humans. It's our bandwidth levels. It's a, it's just it's just how it's just how we're how we're wired. Sorry. Next in my list of five though is delaying feedback, working in big steps. Delaying feedback is costly because it's risky. Yeah. Working in smaller steps gives us more opportunities to learn and more feedback on whether or not we're on the right track. Right. But maybe even more You have to damage your ego every step of the freaking way. But you're doing it in service of battling this thing. Because this thing doesn't care about your ego. This thing could give less of a shit about your ego. This is the this represents all the customer demands and all the things you need to do to make sure the customer the customer buys your stuff and is happy about it, right? So he's not coming back and growing an arm and a leg and biting you in the ass, right? It's all the stuff that you have to do, right? So he's tricky. He's a tricky guy. But and um, hmm. more important than that, working in smaller steps reduces the risks and so gives us the freedom to make mistakes. 
and to recover from them more easily. Right, right. If you expect to, like, if you're going to go in and fight a dragon, you expect that thing to blow some fire on you. You're going to take some hits, man. And anybody that's like, you know, it's like, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. The, the preserver's like, what do you mean take hits? No, you should be already have an automated machine that goes in there and just destroys the thing in one sweep, right? It's like, no, we're going after new ones. We're going after new dragons. We don't know what this thing takes. We are, we're we're gonna we're gonna lose we're gonna lose some hit points. To go. We're gonna lose some 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 ego points, right? How many ego points am I gonna lose by going after this thing? And if you're going in there fighting and you're checking your way all the way up the mountain as you as you find the entrance and and you and you start to deal with this thing, every little stitch of the way is like is like you're checking, you're checking, you're checking. It's like, oh, you so I'm mean, just like going blind, and going. I'm just gonna go that way. And you're not looking around. You can fall off into a ravine. You have no idea. You're looking. You look. Up, you open your eyes. Like, oh, I'm in a ravine. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that, yeah. You're in a ravine. Now, what are you gonna do? If I work for three minutes or thirty minutes before finding out that my changes are wrong, the worst that can happen is that I wasted three or thirty minutes and have learned what not to do next time. Right. If I've worked for three or thirty days, I've lost all that work, and now I'm seriously behind schedule, and I can't remember all of the things that I did over that period of time. Correct. Right. And you know that's the whole thing is like if you don't have the customer on call somewhere, as like as soon as you come up with something new and some in the beginning it's really rapid, and then and then there's it comes up my mind it's like oh okay can we can we got like. Got it nailed down. That's gonna take a little, little more time to redo the next the next version of it. As you throw that one away and took all the learnings of that and make it into the something that actually is a little more solid and can be testable and maintainable and all that stuff. There's there's phases to this thing, right? And it takes a different attitude in each phase, right, to get through to get through and be successful. So it'll be much more difficult to correct and reproduce all of that wasted work, but with the problems fixed. As a result, I'll now be under lots of pressure to rush to get whatever I need to do next and get what I'm doing now into shape. Now I'm more likely to rush and cut corners and so even less likely to do a good job. See, that's where, that's where it goes. That's where it goes. That's the, that's the silver, well, it's the dungeon grind over here. Is when you start to cut corners and you're trying to catch up on the corners that were cut because you did promises of time estimates and how long things are gonna take when you have no idea. And you're, you're forced to lie as opposed to saying, hey, it says, it says the entrepreneur or whoever the guy funding is says, hey, what is it? What did I, I gave him a license, right? He's the quest bearer, right? He says, hey, you got three months. What do you mean? I got three. You got three months to come up with something that either does what you say it's going to do or I'm pulling out or you're done. And it's like, what do you mean? I, I, I need six months. Like you have three. You have three weeks. <laughs> And what will happen is, okay, so people like, so when you're, when you know this, it's not imposed on you when you're coming up, when you're like, I want this adventure too. I want to do this thing. It's like, we only have three weeks. What can you put together? What can you do? Can you put a box up? Can you get, can you get a, a demo going? Can you show off some of the technology? Can you do a hello world? Can you something, something, get it up there. And like at the end of that three weeks, you're like, okay, well, looks like you're onto something here. Mm. Let's do another month or two months. Let's do two months. What do you mean two months? I need six months. Like, well, we'll see what you can do with two months. And that's how this happens. Now, those time scales may change and may di be different depending on how how big of a dragon you are going after. But it shouldn't be that long. So you should be able, you and that way that, that what that does is like, okay, I have three weeks or I have a month, right? And in that period of time, you're expected you better be showing people stuff. You better be getting feedback. You better call, making calls. Getting Zoom calls set up, LinkedIn somehow getting getting it getting it finished, getting figured out, like getting getting product and stuff, getting some mockups, get set up, get. And there's nobody going. Well, how many points is that ticket? I don't know. I have no idea how long it's going to take. If you're asking me how long it's going to take, I don't know. All I know is I got three weeks. Quit bugging me with how long things are going to take. But we, I know the list of order of list things I need to get done, and I'm going to try and do it as best as I can to make sure we get whatever this phase is. If it's in the beginning phase. It's just getting, oh, is this even viable in the middle phase? It's like, okay, here we have some some sort of solution. Let's just try this out of a thousand customers or whatever. And then it's like, okay, we have something or we don't. We have to go back. If we have something, we then build out all the mo all the monitoring and the unit testing. And then we build a whole new version of that just for that, just for that to support now a hundred thousand customers or a million customers, right? That's, that's, and when you build that thing, you're not adding crazy new features. You're just doing the same thing you were doing before, except now, it's scalable, maintainable, blah, blah, blah. And then you can go off to the new, the new one, right? And you keep going in that way, right? You keep going that way. And you try and keep the team small and keep the technology tight. That's why I'm loving KMP because it allows you one person to do web, Android, iOS, desktop, back end, one language, one set of UIs, one set of uh, libraries. That's it.
One working UI, with smaller steps and yeah. validating our work after each small step of our continuous integration right. gives us more clarity and keeps our software in a working state for more of the time. It's a well, he has it says push for CI, and I would say just skip all that stuff in the beginning. You don't need any of that stuff. Now, eventually, you're going to probably need that stuff. Eventually. And when you, if you do want to pass it down to a dungeon grind or a feature factory or death marchers when you sell the company or whatever, uh, it's somebody else's problem, right? But he's, he's a CI, CD company, right? He does also the training, but... This stuff, the CICD stuff has later, way later. Like after you have traction, after you have customers and everybody's paying for it, then you can pull the CICD thing. In the beginning, it's probably going to only be two or three people. So why you don't really need all that stuff? It's an all around win for everyone. Next in my list of five is chasing features over quality. Right. This is an incredibly common mistake. In fact, I guess based on my experience as a consultant, Absolutely. that chasing features like this is probably the most common organizational strategy for software development. Now Most of them appear to be? do to they see all these other companies, all they're doing is adding features. They don't really know where stuff came from. They don't know how those things, features were generated. They didn't have any other conversations. They're like, ooh, we get to put that in ours. And that's where everybody's like, where did you find this out? Oh, no, I came up with it on my own. I I, uh, yeah, I just thought about it on my own. I was like, no, you didn't. You just been looking around other people's stuff and skipping the st you're skipping over the steps. And you're telling your from on high, they're giving the feature set to the lowly programmers. Like, hey, wait a second, uh, I don't think it really fits. It's like, just do it, or we're gonna be out of business next week. It's like, ah, okay, if you're really gonna be out of business next week without this feature, you might have other problems. To organize their work to ensure that everyone's always busy, rather than for maximizing. And that's I've seen that too, boy. That's that's soul crushing. There's your dungeon grind, right? Everyone's got a ticket they have to work on this week. And, Okay, we just finished the project. Okay, can we take, take, no. Rolling into the next one. Rex Sprint. Boom, 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 boom. Wait, wait, can we just take a little break? And like, no, we kind of pushed real hard to get that thing. No. Oh, I get it. It's just a grind. Oh, we're just grinding. Oh, okay, I'm going to drop down my, my effort about to, to about 20% of normal of what I would be if you guys had me involved with this process of like discovering features. But they're not involved because they don't know how to do it. There's no training on this. All they can do is look at them, so analyze the competition. They just put a new button on their thing, so we got to have the same button too. So when I go into a sales call and some customer who has done the same analysis goes, why don't you have this button? And I go, ha, 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 but I do. In production, <laughs> these are not the same thing at all. You can think of this from the perspective of queuing theory. Think of the list of features as existing as a queue of work to be done. How do you maximize the throughput of a queue like that? In a, on an industrial scale, not a, not a real hard problem. But when we're doing knowledge work, you can't do it. It's not possible. All we can do is keep trying stuff. All we can do is keep trying stuff. And you got to be well rested. And you got to have like time to think about some of this stuff. It's, and that's all that all that all takes up time, right? It's just all it takes up time, right? So there's a, there's a, there's this part of it, it's like a pushing rush that you don't have unlimited time. But there's also this like you've been given a block, right? You've been given a block and you're because of your experiences down here, you're expected to, to put something together for that and and have some show some results of it. Like maybe you haven't found the thing yet and you're, you've just done 55 different queries. And here's all the things. Here's all the phone calls. Here's all the people. But we have discovered these things and now we have a better place to go. And we've got this mock-up, right? blah, 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 all that stuff you have to do. And then there's a phase where... You don't want to do any more of that. You just want to implement the thing you already have, already known that you already have that, that meets the customer requirements. So you just want to refine it, make it more solid, make it more testable, make it more extendable somehow, if possible. Or, you know, maybe you've got it all wrapped up in a bow and you're moving on to the next. Maybe we should optimize to have nothing at all in the queue. Clearly, that isn't going to maximize our throughput. So maybe we should organize things to make sure that the queue is always full. That's what we're doing when we prioritize feature production over everything else. Yeah. We're keeping the queue always full. The problem with this is that it leaves no room for urgent work, things that need to jump the, the queue. And even right. or or, or um, changes to the queue. Like this is a, every single project I've been on since 2012, they never changed the queue. Even though because we're not being we're not part of this see that whole agile process of changing the backlog and all that stuff, that was really meant for this adventure driven stuff. But people said, oh, no, it's just a list of to-do items. Oh, I know how that works. And it's like, no, but it's, you're, you're trying to do explore. It's like, well, I already explored it because I just looked at the other companies that are doing the same thing we're doing, and they just added this feature. So just add this feature, right? And worse, it applies pressure on those of us servicing the queue to cut corners again. Well, that's, that takes a lot of skill to go research somebody else's company's uh, software offerings and then go just add, oh, wow, you're a, you're a business genius. 
to to be able to do that. Wow. I mean, a develop developers could do that. I mean, do bring something to the table that's more than just oh that person over there had the feature, so I'm gonna add the feature. It's like no. Why? Does it make sense? Why are you copying other people's stuff and software? You know that's you know it's a lava lake of direct competition. You know that. All somebody has to do is ad- or ad- advertise you or add another sales guy on your toes. That doesn't make no sense. Yeah, because we're being measured on the rate at which we process features. So we end up producing poor quality work. The problem with this is that increasing oh. and maintaining effective high volume feature production is a marathon and not a sprint. Right. We need to allow space to do work that isn't directly related to for the features. Yeah. Work that helps us to maintain or even increase the pace at which we can do new things. This. Well... I mean, sometimes that's necessary. Sometimes it's necessary to like not go fast and like go a little slower and figure out well, what are we doing? What exactly are we doing here? This sort of work is a lot more valuable than work that only focuses on features and makes us go slower and slower, which is exactly what happens when we do low quality work. We need to keep our systems tidy and maintain them as a good place to do work. We need to verify that the features that we build work and continue to work. Now that's the next phase. Like that's the, that's the, that's the final phase. Now he's more familiar with the final phase, right? He's a little familiar with the with the with the with the exploratory phase, but this other phase he's talking about, yeah. Once you got something, you have like more than a thousand customers, yeah. Make sure it's all buttoned up for sure, and and it's designed in a way we can fix it and understand it and onboard and onboard. You have to design software to be that way, to be livable. In the beginning, it's not probably going to be livable, and maybe you shouldn't even try to make it livable. Just try and make it do something. The one thing that we needed to do. And if you can't design it that way, and you I mean, what are you making? You're trying to just copy somebody else's stuff? If you're trying to do that, it's like really gotta ask why. And are you really gonna compete with whatever else the thing you copy with? Because you gotta do all the same stuff that they're doing. If you're just copying somebody, it's like just there's other places to go put your effort in that will be will make more sense that you can that you can own and do the thing that you find to be important. And lots of other things that help us to do a good job. If we don't focus on the quality of what we build, it becomes more and more difficult to add new features, and we end up going slower and slower. Sometimes until we stop altogether. Yeah, we must. That's been a lot of companies, like several companies I've worked for, do this. That they just couldn't go anywhere. Tend the systems that we build. It's naive nonsense to only prioritize features, but I'm afraid that it's a very common form of naive nonsense. Mm-hmm. Last in my list is manual regression testing. Manual testing certainly has a place in software development, but that place isn't regression testing. Human beings are wonderfully creative and inventive. We want them to make the most of that when they test our systems, exploring them and taking a much more subjective view of their quality and utility. So what do we usually do? We demand that they do the same things for every release to check that the system... Yeah, I've worked at several companies that have done this. Now, sometimes they have a team that helps out with it, but uh, or when I worked before 2012, the, the systems that, that were put together were all manually great regress. We didn't really have a concept of this this manual, this uh, automated testing. And a lot of companies I've worked with have also, this is the last step, and they actually didn't make the product testable. So they're trying to take, they're basically doing the classic thing where they get an MVP. The original team leaves because they can't maintain it. They bring in somebody else to fix the MVP to get it to get it functional without like extending it or making it anything more to it so we're just adding stuff onto it and each time we have to do manual regression tests and you know trying to get them to so one of the companies i was working at like trying to get them to convince like hey this manual regression test stuff has taken the whole team three or four days to get through is there a way that we could automate this stuff and they're like yeah i I guess you could and that's like and trying to make that happen it was so difficult they're like why can't we get this project done? So, well, if you have all your developers doing manual regression tests, it's going to have an impact on getting this, getting these products out the door. And what I didn't realize at the time was that the person who had the last remnant of the team, who was kind of just kind of there by default because she didn't quit, um, she was the one in charge of the project now, and she was kind of done with this company, and she hadn't found another company to go to yet and she hadn't really made her mind up where like what she wanted to do that but she knew that she had to have this finished on her resume <laughs> so instead of adding this testing stuff she just wanted the thing to ship she did let me do one little t- test to show how it could be done like you could actually test this project without this full-on checklist and uh but that's, she was like, okay. And then we, then we, so we got that project done. We went on to the next one. We, no testing at all. It's all manual regression stuff. 
I was like, can we do this? Like, ah. Uh, and then she left. <laughs> she was like, done. I was like, oh, okay. Well, lessons learned, right? So there are, there, the, the extending the MVP is like the classic thing. Just a few, just a few bugs to fix. A few, they'll just need a couple bugs fixed, right? Just need a few bugs to fix a few bugs. <laughs> so they always say that. And it's way worse than that. They have an MVP somebody wrote and they laughed. And they didn't leave any documentation or it can't be talked to because it was bad blood for, for maybe good reason. Uh, and yeah, they wanted to like, just come in and just fix it. It's like, oh, no, this thing's, this thing's architected so gnarly. Like, what is it? It was built like a, like a Winchester house. If you don't know the Winchester house, you can look that up in San Jose. It was built like that. It was like a little thing was put on. They didn't say, okay, now we take the MVP. We don't, this isn't our product. We take this MVP that's serving 100 customers, right? rewrite to the maintainable thing and then maybe another rewrite after that as to the really super really solid thing like nah, they didn't want to do that <laughs> they just wanted to limp along and wonder why their development cycle gets stalled every every release <laughs> working properly. sometimes we even produce test scripts for humans to follow treating them rather like parts in the machine yeah this is not only slow and inefficient but oh. it's also low quality and a misuse of human skills and talent it's goofy. humans aren't good at being that repeatable Standard. Machines are wonderful at fast, precise repetition. Right. If you've written the software on Android, it wasn't all that easy to do it this way. You have to write the software in a certain way to be testable. So you have to have the, the, the idea in mind that when you're writing the software in the first place to write it to make to be testable. And when you're doing the MVP rapid thing, you're not doing that. That's not part of it. That's only after you're like, OK, we got the MVP. We have a little bit of traction someplace, somehow, somewhere. And now we're going to do the real thing with the testing and the manual, uh, the elimination of manual regression and making everything separated out and all that stuff. That's extremely difficult to do those two things at the same time. And every company I've worked at is trying to do it and they fail because all the, the original team leaves. <laughs> As opposed to like, it took them just about the, amount of, the same amount of time. It's like, if we were to come on and say, okay, this is the example that we're using now and we're just going to rewrite this thing. And then we just went through and that team got together and rewrote it. Uh, and with her help, with her insights, that would have been awesome. But we didn't get to do that. We didn't get to do that. So anyway. So we should use them for that and humans for the more creative work. Regression testing or regression testing should be done by machines via automated tests. Right. This has lots of positive outcomes. But that's very difficult because you have to design it in a way. That means you have to have the MVP already thing. I'm, I'm repeating myself, but it's like he's saying it so casually, like you just write the... CICD into the beginning project when you're rapidly reading through, reading through this thing and you have to do three versions in a week and they're all very different. And then the CICD, they can't write tests for that stuff because it's always moving, it's changing too fast. It means that we can run these tests as often as we like. And if you're sensible, that means that we run them continuously or at least every- <laughs> for, the, for, the, for the production, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for the production app, but not, the, so he's mixing these two spheres of between this MVP uh, uh, proof of concept stuff to CICD, continuously tested, maintainable, forever type stuff. <laughs> we can't change so he never tells you when he switches. That's one of the things that is annoying. Maybe in his mind, he doesn't have a switch. It's all just one thing. Maybe in his mind that the enterprise customers that he works with who can afford to have do all this stuff and have the time to take a year to do an MVP, maybe, maybe that's not anything. But what it takes to make useful, repeatable tests is that we need them to work in controlled circumstances where the results of our test can be deterministic within the scope of the test. Right, this course. encourages us to make design choices that not only result in more testable systems, but also generally better design systems. Right. So there's the whole thing about getting the product right and then getting the getting the actual system dialed in. Those are those are really different things, man. Those are really diff different two different skill sets. And um, yeah, there's not a lot. I just haven't seen a lot of good overlap between that stuff. People don't know how to tune and dial it in the system with that current tech, whatever the tech is. I mean, with KMP, it's a lot easier because you don't have to fuck with so many damn crazy different systems. You're just, you're just in Kotlin land. You're just in you know Java, Kotlin. Well, it's just Kotlin, really. Uh, but like those are two different skill sets, right? And there's one that's super like expressive and creative and lots of ideas and doesn't mind failing. And the other one's like failure is not an option. <laughs> as well. 
It's difficult to build testable systems without they are modular and cohesive, with good separation of concerns, clean lines right. of abstraction between the parts of the system, and right. all minimal, minimally coupled with each other. Right. So, so I have a course on my on my channel called How to Program from the Ground Up, and it goes into this. It goes up from the from the ground up how to how to think about these sims, and and there's a section at the end called uh, Boop, uh, back to object oriented programming, which is Alan Kay style uh, programming, which I have a bunch of examples of, and that does all this. Uh, takes all this stuff into into mind. Not OOP, but boop. Not OOP. OOP should be taken back around back and put out of its misery. But boop, the stuff that Alan Kay was talking about with the messaging stuff, this is all this stuff. This is all this stuff here. These things are not only what it takes to make our systems testable. These are not just optional extras. These things are also the hallmarks of high quality systems. Right, but when you're building an MVP, you may not want to think about all this crap. You just might make it all tied together, make it all not modular, whatever. But by the time you actually want to get something into production that's going to be stable, that you can monitor and not drive people crazy because it's crashing all the time, uh, yeah, you're going to have to redesign it in this in this way. Uh, I don't recommend it for the prototype or the MVP, but for like but a production thing, yes, you got you to gotta do all this stuff. You have to. If you don't, you're just going to stick yourself <laughs> and bleed. And code. Organizations often resort to manual testing because they think of their systems as non-deterministic. And whole large systems can indeed be that. But this is just a fact about any complex system. But it doesn't mean that we can't test it. It means that we need to design things to make them more easily testable. Mm -hmm. That includes designing things in ways that allow us to control the variables during the scope of the test. Right, yeah, of course, that's a, after you know what the thing does, all this stuff has to be done, but it's, this is a different focus, right? So that we can measure the things that we need to measure and get the same results every time. This is just as true for non-software systems as for software, but it's usually considerably easier for software because it's so malleable. So let's not abdicate our responsibility to make our systems testable. Let's not aim to throw the problem of testing over the wall to armies of manual testers. As Deming famously said, you can't inspect quality into a product. It must right. be built into it. Right, so, so, so the, but also the, what but Deming's talking about is that, is that we have to find the quality first, right? We have to find the quality somehow. We have to find the quality that, will, uh, that our customer will, will find for, you know, that, that's doing something better than what they're doing now, right? Easier, faster, cheaper, blah, blah, blah. So, so, so once we find that, then we concentrate on making the software that we're writing high quality. And that means rewriting it from scratch with all this stuff in mind, with the goal of we're building that thing and making it extensible and easy to modular and all that stuff, uh, message, message coordinated, blah, 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 all that stuff has to be after you find the product market fit. And a lot, of, and, 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 and the deadly, the deadly mistake of extending your MVP, just you, you have to say no to that. It's, it's a good way to get rid of all the tacit knowledge that you have collected on your team and they'll just leave. They'll just leave. It's like, there's no, we're not doing that. And it is a different, but it also is a different mindset. So you might have to put those other people on a different project, right? You have the MVP people and then you have the refine and get into production people. Walked into it. If you avoid these five pitfalls, you'll already be doing a considerably better job than most organizations. And almost certainly, you'll be a lot more productive, be having more fun doing it, and probably making more money with your software products too. Well, because you're not going to make money, because you're not going to go with something that doesn't make money until you get it going. All right, that's enough of this. Uh, I, I like his... Save a little money. Oh. Um... Well, that was my next video, because <laughs> he's an adventure... Steve Jobs, adventure-driven developer, for sure. Let's go over here. Um, yeah, so I love his channel. His stuff's good, but you have to memorize... Remember, remember he's sponsored and he's trying to get big enterprise clients and um he's not 100 percent adventure driven driven because he's talking about building this ci cd stuff from the beginning it's like eee. okay so we're doing a two-year mvp we're doing a year mvp or right, can we do it faster than that can we do a three-month mvp and then build your ci cd pipeline stuff on the end of it that'd be better plan all right give me a like and subscribe i'll talk to you soon i'm chris